Um, and I was very fortunate to sit back in my chair and really literally sit back in my chair and, and be wowed um, by somebody who was really getting it done. Um, and so very, very pleased um, to bring Hunter Lovins. Come on up here. I'm not going to read your bio. We've all read your bio. Come on up here. Give her a great big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, Calgary. It is such an honor to be back here. You have one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And to be coming to a meeting on pathways to sustainability in Calgary is a singular honor. And how about that last presentation? <laughs> Serious, wow. Listen. In almost every building we inhabit, there's a sound. Are they healthful to us? Probably not. I think in light of what we just heard, I know I am going to rethink a whole lot about how do we go about achieving true sustainability in our lives. Bucky Fuller said, we're called to be the architects of the future, not its victims. And so much of the talk these days is victim talk. The, the world's coming to an end, and there, there's some scary science out there. But how do we architect a future that works for 100% of humanity? That was Bucky's goal. And here in Calgary, imagine Calgary has taken the steps to have a 100-year vision of what a city can be, of what a community can be. Good on you, Calgary. Because here are some of the challenges we're facing. The UN has said by 2030, and that's just a heartbeat away, we're going to need 50% more food, 45% more energy, 30% more water. Business as usual is the utopian scenario. It's not going to be like that. We're going to have to reinvent how we do everything. Lester Brown points out China, just China, business as usual, by 2030 is going to want more oil than the world now lifts or probably can ever lift. I mean, one of Alberta's mental models is, OK, we got all the energy the world's ever going to need. No, you don't. China's going to want it all. And Canada has already had experience with Chinese companies coming here to buy a scarce resource, potash. Uh, they'll be back. We're going to live in cities. Many of the environmental mental models, hello, are that <laughs> if we win, we're all going to live in quaint little villages. No, the world is going to live in cities. Three quarters of the world will be there by 2030. Just China alone. China is building a new Manhattan every year. And we can't make it with cities being just a little bit greener. We're going to have to rethink cities. So is business as usual OK for Alberta? There are people who will tell you it is. You're one of the healthiest economies around. You're increasing at, well, perhaps it's not Chinese rates of 15% a year or even the preferred uh, equity holders rate of 8% a year. But you're healthier than the rest of Canada. And in many ways, Alberta's economic health, drawn from resource extraction, is driving the health of Canada. But you have a little problem. Organizations as... Uh, diverse and conservative as the International Energy Agency, which for years has said, peak oil, nah, no, don't worry about peak oil. There's lots of oil. OECD, this is the well, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the Growth Booster Club of the Rich Nations, the World Bank. The World Bank has been loaning on essentially any resource extraction project anywhere around the world. In the last couple of years, all three of these have come out and said, 
If we don't get a handle on climate change by 2017, we will lock in six degree C warming. Six degrees C is not survivable, not by, not by humans, not by life as we know it. The drought indices are showing, even here in Canada, much of what you now count on as your agricultural land will be too dry for farming as we know it. Moisture deficits already showing up. In my country, in the last year, the drought in the Midwest cut corn production 13%. This, of course, raised food prices, and food is now at record heights around the world. This, of course, translates into your grocery bill. Drought also affects a lot of other things. <laughs> Water, for starts. Goldman Sachs is now saying water will be the petroleum of the next decade. And there is a connection between water, energy, food. Most of the water that we use goes to irrigated agriculture. Almost half the world's food is now grown in areas where it could not be grown if we didn't have irrigation. And yet we're entering a period of greater drought, greater water stress. And at the same time, we're growing a lot of crops to make biofuel turning an energy problem into a food problem. This, of course, has other implications. If you reflect that the Arab Spring was caused by a food riot in Tunisia. Tom Friedman had a piece in the New York Times this Sunday on the extent to which the drought in Syria contributed to the unrest that's now going on in Syria. And I don't know if you saw yesterday the Israelis have said, We're, we'll take out any weapons that are brought into Syria. And the Russians said, we are shipping air defense missiles to Syria to keep the United States and NATO countries from creating a no-fly zone. I mean, we are literally teetering on the brink of a very nasty war kicked off by a drought. In both your country and mine, water flows uphill to money. Who has the money? Well, now it's the frackers. In my country, farmers used to paying 300, or excuse me, $30 an acre foot for water are now having to bid against oil and gas companies willing to pay 1,000, 2,000. And the fracking in, say, the Powder River Basin is changing the landscape. Now they're talking about fracking farmland. Wait a minute, we need to eat. The water that comes back up from the fracking is too polluted to drink, and it's a lot. Millions of gallons of water. So of course, both BC and here in Alberta, you're competing to get the fracking companies to come and locate because of the jobs, because of the economic prosperity. You can't eat money. The scientists have started getting together and asking, are we exceeding the planetary boundaries? Global Biodiversity Outlook 3 says all the world's major ecosystems are tipping into collapse, three of them particularly now. Coral reefs, Sc sorry scuba divers, business as usual, there will be no living coral reefs on planet Earth, perhaps as early as 2050. The Amazon, the Amazon is the Earth's lungs, this is a bit more serious, and the oceans are acidifying. Now, uh, why should we care? Um, we can live without oysters, yeah. When the oceans acidify the Little uh, calciferous critters that have seashells lose the integrity of their shells and can't reproduce. Uh, I can live without an oyster. All of us are might sentimental about breathing, and about half the oxygen on Earth comes from little calciferous critters called phytoplankton. We are living in a time of 
literally unprecedented increase in temperatures the world around. We had been in a time of decline, and we've hit a brick wall. Now, in one sense, and people say save the Earth, the Earth will be fine. This has happened at least three times before in the Earth's history. 60 to 90 percent of species went extinct, and yet here we all are. Uh, the Earth is amazingly resilient. As George Carlin said, it'll shake us off like a bad case of fleas. But I don't know about you, but I am a bit sentimental about this human experiment. <laughs> when the economists say climate change is real, it's real. You're seeing it here in the Rockies with the melting of the glaciers, with the changing of the timing of spring in Edmonton the first flowering date of the aspens is moving earlier and earlier. Much of agriculture here around depends on the meltwater from the glaciers. The glaciers are receding. And when you pump all this energy, this extra heat, into the earth, into the atmosphere, into the oceans, you get events like Hurricane Sandy that hit New York. This was LaGuardia Airport, or the New York subways, which flooded. Now, sure, the science is uncertain. That's what science is. We argue about it, yeah? Here's the science on climate change I like. And let me suggest that it doesn't matter. Now, I say this with all deference to the great climate scientists who are spending their careers trying to get the science to catch up with observed reality, because things like the melting of the polar caps is happening faster than the models say it ought to. But let's assume the skeptics are right. Uh, don't go to Las Vegas on the odds of that being true. But if all you are is a profit-maximizing capitalist, you'll do exactly what you'd do if you were scared to death about climate change because we know how to solve this problem at a profit. It's what the smart companies are already doing. So if climate change is a hoax, we'll all make a lot of money. If it's not a hoax, we'll make a lot of money. Either way, let's go. In that sense, the science just became bar talk. We can argue about it over drinks. But in the meantime, as part of business, let's solve this problem. That's the thesis of my recent book, The Way Out, Kickstarting Capitalism to Save Our Economic Ass. Because in addition to losing things like ecosystems and the climate, we're losing the economy. And we now know, even in my country, which has no regulation on carbon, no price on carbon, companies that are bringing to market innovations around using less carbon are financially outperforming their competitors that are not. And similarly, the companies that are carbon intensive are being penalized in the market, even though there's no regulatory regime. The companies that report to the Carbon Disclosure Project and are doing the best to reduce their emissions have twice the average return as the Global 500. Here in Canada, the Canadian CEOs are supporting putting a price on carbon. The, this is an organization of CEOs with about 3.5 trillion in assets. Vast majority of companies exporting, investment, research, training companies. Why? because we know that there's an enormous opportunity for implementing energy efficiency, cutting waste, oh, and solving the climate problem. 90% of the companies responding to the Carbon Disclosure Project saw more business opportunities as a result of climate regulation than they saw an economic threat. A lot of this you can do for free. What do I mean? My team walked into a company, had 6,300 computers and monitors they left on 24-7 because of some urban myths. Shortens the life of the computer to turn it off and on. No. IT needs it left on 24-7. 
No, one night a week would do fine. In this company, just publishing a policy, turn the darn things off if you're not home, would save the company $700,000 the first year. Guys, this is free money. The economists amongst us would tell us this isn't possible in what is manifestly a perfect market. If these kind of savings existed, they would have been captured. This is a real story. In my country, we waste $2.8 billion every year leaving computers on with nobody home. It's a big chunk of the cost of running an office building. Well, Ford Motor Company figured this out, published such a policy, saved themselves a million dollars the first year. You can do it at home. Well, it's beer money. With this kind of inefficiency throughout our economy, it shouldn't surprise us that your country and mine use about twice the energy to produce a unit of economic value as do our European and Asian competitors, which after all are signatories to Kyoto and thus are implementing climate protection. Oh, you guys were a signatory to Kyoto too. Interestingly, interestingly, here in Alberta, you have a climate management strategy. Uh, most of it, though, to be achieved, 50% reduction by 2050 after most of us are safely dead. How do we do this? How do we go about it? My team worked with a little company in California called Mi Rancho Tortillas. They uh, make tortillas. Their COO, Joe Santana, had no earthly interest in sustainability, but he wanted to sell to Walmart. Walmart, as you will hear tomorrow, or the next day, is now interested in sustainability. He said, what do I do? We helped him do a lighting retrofit, get more efficient ovens, eliminate waste packaging in how he boxed up the tortillas. He's going to save $450,000 over the next couple of years. You better believe he's now a big fan of sustainability. In your community, per megawatt saved, you generate over $2 million in increased economic activity, over half a million dollars in increased wages, and 10 times the number of jobs you would get from investing in any kind of central station power plant. So do we want more money in our communities? Do we want more jobs? We know how to get them. First place to start is buildings. The average community's carbon footprint comes from its buildings. In places like Chicago, it's 70%. In New York, it's almost 90% of the carbon footprint is your built environment. So I was glad to see that today was about the built environment. And think about it, if you cut just 30% of your energy, and we know how to make buildings net zero, they have no ongoing energy load. In a 100,000 square foot office building, that's 44,000 a year. So policies like you have in Manitoba, which as a province committed to meet Kyoto, where all of the new buildings that get any public money have to be lead, where they're investing in weatherization and building an economy based on companies to meet this kind of policy. This is the kind of economic development that will build a sustainable future. We were talking, Don was talking in the last session about health. Green buildings are healthier. I think now I may know why, in part. When you put people in good green buildings, you get 6 to 16% higher labor productivity. Why? Maybe they can hear themselves think. You get reduced health care costs. You don't get as many sick workers. Even if you don't care about energy, if you don't care about the climate, you do care as a business person, you care what you're spending money on. You spend 100 times on people what you spend on energy. So if you get even a 1% increase in productivity of your people, that will dwarf the savings you get from saving some energy. 
But who cares? You get both by doing the same thing. This is in part why green building is sweeping the market. And in this country and in my country, we've got, we're not even close to best practice. Beds Ed in the UK, this is an entire community, zero energy district. And the, uh, the Z Lab in the UK is now doing these kinds of projects in places like China. How cool is that? One of the ways they get zero energy is they start with super efficiency and then they move on to renewables. Renewables are winning. This debate is over. We are slowly, as a world, moving to renewables. Solar is perhaps the fastest growing renewable energy. 4.3 gigawatts added for 2013, even more than that 2014. And how much new nuclear did we get last year? Not a lot. Japan, Japan has recognized there's a little problem with nuclear. I've never heard anybody call for an evacuation plan from a solar farm. Solar spills, that's a bad one. China, 2.4 billion going into renewables, 100 gigawatts of wind. A gigawatt is roughly a nuclear-sized chunk of electricity. Wind, second fastest growing technology. 35% of all the new generating capacity in my country in the last year or so came from wind, less than 15% of it coming from new coal. Canada has a lot of wind. We were just talking about OMAC and about the hoodoos and about the wind. You get even further east from here, you have a lot of wind, steady wind. And it's the fastest growing renewable energy source here in Canada. Can we, uh, wind projects could supply 20% of Canadian energy by 2020. The Black Springs Ridge farm has just started to go into operation. It kind of got held up. Enbridge stepped up and is now a 50% owner. Thank you, Enbridge. Here in Alberta, again, you have an, an amazing opportunity for new wind. And we're still nowhere near what we could be. Wind Vision 2025. Alberta's going to need, on current projections, seven gigawatts more. You can meet that through wind. We brought on more new wind around the world in the last couple of years than the entire nuclear capacity in Japan. And guess what? Wind and gas match up very nicely. So even if you still want to drill for gas, have a gas industry, gas can be a very nice part of a transition to 100% renewable. This is what uh, the Ontario Green Energy Act is trying to get at. And some folk have, uh, uh, I don't know if you've been following the reviews of Chris's book, uh, the Leap is an excellent, excellent book, and I'm, I'll be thrilled to, uh, to chat with him a bit after this. Some folk have been attacking it because it favors the feed-in tariff system, as in Ontario. Chris is right. Feed-in tariffs work. Why is it that California gets 70% more sun than cold, cloudy Germany, but in the last couple of years, the Germans have installed 28 times the amount of solar every year as is installed in California because they have good policy. Germany is aiming at being 100% renewably powered perhaps as early as 2040, certainly by 2050. The feed-in tariff system in Germany set a price over a 20-year investment horizon, very much the way the oil and gas boys have always had their investment with a, with a guaranteed payout over time for the investors. Fine, do the same thing for renewables. In Germany, it created over 480,000 new jobs, dropped the price of solar to the point where it's grid parity. 
but it costs more. Oh, can't possibly have that. Deutsche Bank did a study. Yeah, it costs more, about uh, $50 a year, two to three euro a month more. 8.6 billion euro per year. Ooh, that's starting to sound like a lot. What Deutsche Bank found was, had the Germans done nothing, had they just kept burning coal, they would have paid 9.4 billion euro more. Sorry, you're gonna pay more. You're gonna pay less more if you have good policy. I know, that's a tough one to wrap your head around. You're gonna pay more. Get used to that. The question is, what kind of a future do you wanna have? And in Germany, we now have towns that are 100% renewably powered. Will Polls read more than 100% renewably powered, and so it sells the excess, making money for the community. 5.7 million a year. Think about your little towns. Wouldn't they like $5.7 million? Mark Jacobson at Stanford has shown that, yes, it is technically feasible for the entire world to shift to 100% renewable power by 2030. NMAX is one of the utilities on the North American continent that time to time looks at this and goes, yeah, that could work, and is beginning to put in place the ingredients of the utility of the future. Things like microgeneration, reducing greenhouse gases, enabling employees to participate. We're gonna make this transition. We're going to make it in a very difficult, unpleasant way, or we're going to make it by design, but in part we're going to make it because that's where the jobs are. I know it's awfully tempting to say, but we got all of this energy to the north. If we wish to have a habitable world, most of that energy will stay in the ground. And if we wish to have a good economy in our communities, we will be investing in the technologies that deliver jobs. In California, the green economy has been growing at three times the rate of the traditional economy. Occam Steiner of the UN Environment Program uh, teamed up with the International Labor Organization, did a study of green jobs. He reckons at least half the global workforce will be involved in green by 2030. And there are many, many ways to do this. Here's my favorite. The Scots. The Scots are going to be 100% renewably powered by 2020. Yeah, it's, most of it's gonna be big wave, some wind, some forest, some hydro, but they're taking the waste from their premier industry and turning it into electricity and turning it into butanol, which if you're still gonna drive cars, is probably the fuel of choice. Well, unless you wanna go electric. How cool is this? You park in the shade and then you power your car with the, uh, with the electricity from the sun. Your car is parked almost all day long. Let it be a little power plant. Now here's another area that we're going to reinvent, agriculture. Agriculture as currently practiced is essentially wholly unsustainable. Apply exactly the same principles of basic natural capitalism. Start with dramatically increased efficiency, move on to redesigning how we make and deliver everything, doing business the way nature does, and investing in human and natural capital. Investing in our farming and ranching communities, in our rural economy. We know, for example, that organic farms are more energy efficient. Alan Savory, won the Buckminster Fuller Award last year for showing that grazing animals, properly managed, managed the way herds have always co-evolved with grasslands, dense packed by predators, chopping the ground up, fertilizing it, and then moving on. His approach to 
holistic management has shown you can double the carrying capacity of cattle even on very degraded western rangeland. This is good economics for the rancher. And it puts carbon back in the ground. Alan believes this is the technology that can save humanity. Ranching, that's something Alberta's good at. And now over 300 Albertan ranchers are practicing this. Land can absorb a great amount of carbon. Remember the stories of the early pioneers coming across my country, your country, and finding deep black soil. That's carbon. How did it get into the soil? Grazing animals. Nibbled the grass, the roots slough carbon. Over the years, it builds up. We have been decarbonizing our grass and our farmlands by the way in which we manage them. So companies like the TK Ranch here in Alberta have been showing there's a different way of doing it. Grass-fed, for those of you who eat beef, cows were never intended to eat corn. They, they eat grass. They do very well on grass. Much of the lands around the world cannot sustain uh, irrigated farm agriculture. We're not going to have the water, but you can run cattle on them. When you feed corn to cattle, you change the omega oils from three to six. Grass beef has higher conjugated linoleic acid than fish. It's <laughs> It may turn out to be the health food, eh? Sustainability is happening. Whether it be articles in Harvard Business Review or sustainability certifications or conferences or my friend Yvonne Chouinard, founder of Patagonia, getting the cover of Fortune magazine or Walmart going green, it's happening. And it's happening for one fundamental reason, which is it's better business. No, we're not talking about these guys. They will eat you. We're talking about business. When those wild-eyed environmentalists at Goldman Sachs tell you that the companies who, that are the leaders in environment, social, and good governance policy have 25% higher stock value than their less sustainable competitors, there's a business case. This is a report of reports, which you can download from my website, which I'll put up at the end, called Sustainability Pays. There are now 46 separate such studies from all the big management consulting houses, Harvard Business, MIT Sloan, all saying essentially the same thing. Sustainability pays. Harvard. Sustainability isn't the burden on the bottom line it was thought to be. It is the touchstone of all of innovation. And in the future, only companies that make it a goal will achieve competitive advantage. Here in Alberta, PricewaterhouseCoopers, having a strategy in all industries is a necessity as sustainability has become a hot topic. All companies should have a sustainability plan, act now, if you don't pay attention to the issues of sustainability in your business, you may not be in business. So surprise, even the oil and gas companies are now beginning to talk sustainability. Why? Because cutting your use of resources is the quickest way to enhance profitability. Here's another reason. If you want to attract the best talent, they want to work for a responsible company. Ray Anderson, founder of Interface Carpets, was one of the first to show this. And he iconically said, what's the business case for ending life on Earth? I mean, in one sense, I'm embarrassed to be standing up here saying, there's a business case. I shouldn't have to say that to you. But there really is a business case, and Ray showed it. He set mission zero, zero impact, zero footprint, as a goal by 2020. And the, the organization has been systematically cutting its footprint, its impact, and increasing its use of resources. Sales up two-thirds, profits doubled. 
Walmart. If you'd have told me 10 years ago that the entity on the planet doing the most to drive sustainability around the world would be the evil empire, I'd have offered to eat my hat. <laughs> but here we are. Walmart has pledged to become 100% renewably powered, zero waste, carbon neutral, and sell sustainable products. Why? Trust me, it is not out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it because it's better business. And Walmart Canada has been one of the leaders in this because they realize, among other things, it enables them to better manage their supply chain. Cutting energy 30%. This is just good business. But Walmart has lost the position as the company doing the most to drive this. Who took it over? the little startup called Unilever. Paul Pullman. Pullman came from Nestle. Again, hardly the source you would think of sustainability. And almost the day that he became the CEO at Unilever, he announced he was not going to report quarterly to Wall Street. What? And there was a massive kerfuffle. Uh, he, you know, when, when asked, how did you get the courage to do this? He said, well, they just hired me. I didn't think they'd fire me on the first day. <laughs> Ray Anderson owned his company. Yvonne Chouinard owns Patagonia. The Walton family functionally owns Walmart. Paul is the first hired CEO to do something like this. And what he said was, if you think, if as a stockholder, as an owner, you think that my managing your holdings by investing in such a way as to drive up profitability quarter by quarter is going to create core business value, he said, I respect you as a human being. I don't want you as my owner. He said, Wall Street's a casino. The, market, the traders make money if the market goes up or down. My company doesn't. He said, I am in business to serve the customer. And I will best serve the customer by committing, he said, to the sustainable living plan. Cut our environmental impacts in half by 2020. Source everything that comes from something grown from sustainable agriculture and lift a billion people out of poverty. Go, Paul. This is genuine corporate courage. And so I was honored about a month ago to join Unilever's North American Sustainability Advisory Board. Because time is very short. Normal business as usual isn't going to get it done. I like this cartoon from Sidney Harris, two old boys scribbling <laughs> equations. And in the middle it says that a miracle occurs. And the one old boy says to the other, I think you need to be a little more explicit here in step two. Yet we're going to need a miracle. I fear it's not coming from the governments. This was a poster that was in the Copenhagen airport, December of 2009, when the world came together in theory to put in place a new Kyoto Accord and failed. Our countries both talk about cutting their emissions but that's about all they're doing. So who? Who's going to do it? People like Paul Pullman, but I think more. Entrepreneurs. In nature, carbon is not the world's greatest poison. It's the building block of all of life. So let's get clever. If humans are anything, they're clever. And companies like Calera, have realized that things in nature soak up carbon. They said, where does cement come from? We dig up limestone, we grind it up, we calcine it at very high temperatures, thereby releasing a great deal of CO2, and then we turn it into cement. How did the limestone get there in the first place? Coral reefs, coral reefs take carbon out of the water and make it into calcium carbonate if they're not warmed or acidified. 
So they said, can we mimic a coral reef? So they're taking the flue gas from a natural gas plant and misting seawater through it and making the equivalent of cement. Now, the cement industry won't let them call it cement, but it does the same job. Jeff Coates, a scientist at Cornell, is making plastic out of carbon. There is, in the next week or so, a major convention in Germany, CO2 as a feedstock. This is getting to the notion introduced by Janine Benyus, founder of a concept called biomimicry. Again, asking this question, how does nature do business? Nature makes a wide array of products and services very differently than we do. Nature runs on sunlight, not big flows of fossil energy. Nature makes everything near to something that's alive at room temperature, at ambient temperature, wasting nothing and shopping locally. These principles of biomimicry are now being used by some of the leading industries. And you can go on the website, the Biomimicry Guild, the Biomimicry Institute. There's now a whole website, Ask Nature, collecting examples of how nature solves various problems. And here is the question for Alberta. I climb on an airplane tomorrow and go away. You guys stay here. What do you want your future to be? Are you a resource colony? You are rich in a lot of resources. Is this what you want your future to be? If you could choose the future for Alberta, what would it be? And don't just do this on an emotional basis. Look at the statistics. Energy as a segment of your economy is declining. Manufacturing is increasing. Tourism is increasing. You're getting to have a reasonably diversified economy. Not a bad idea. What do you want your future to be? Think about it and think about history. Go back to the first industrial revolution when we invented commerce using water power to make iron and textiles. And then we moved on to the steam engine, James Watt and locomotives. Where did that happen? Where was the first industrial revolution? England. And what was happening geopolitically at that time? The British Navy ruled the waves. The sun never set on the British Empire. This little island off the coast of Europe ruled the world. Why? Because they innovated. And then some fool found oil in Pennsylvania, and Henry Ford built a car, and Thomas Edison built a light bulb in General Electric. And power shifted across the Atlantic to North America. Until by the time World War II rolled around, the industrial might of Detroit was able to pivot in 90 days from making cars to making tanks and airplanes. And this has been the North American century. And then we moved on to the IT revolution, gave us all these little things in our pockets with 3,000 songs on them. I didn't know I needed one until I couldn't live without it. What's Next, what is the economy of the future going to be? This, I think, is the question that anyone interested in sustainability ought to be focused on. What is the economy that you want? Remember, who innovates rules the world. Digging it up out of the ground is so last century. Who innovates rules the world. What does the world need? The world needs sustainability. It needs green chemistry. It needs biomimicry. It needs renewable energy. Maimonides said each one of us should see ourselves as though the entire world is held in balance. And any deed we do could tip the scales. I'm deeply grateful to each one of you for spending 
your time here, for being in this conversation, and for bringing me back to Alberta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hunter, for that. We, um, I know that there's, um, while you were talking, a lot of people go, ooh, ooh, and lots of, hmm, hmm. I bet you there's more than a few questions. Could we take two? Who would like to, I know, but we're here for a couple of days. Um, Hunter Lovins, do you have a few minutes to take a sure, few sure, questions? absolutely. So it's enough about me, because you've already heard from me. So who has a question that they would like, that comes out of this presentation before we move? Up to the front here, please, and shout it out. All right. Uh, are you worried about, uh, for wind power, the, the issues with bats and birds and so on, and how that's going to play out? Am I worried about bats and birds and wind power? Sure. With every technology, it's really important to do it right. The early wind turbines killed some raptors. But even the U.S. Audubon Society says, build wind, not coal. Coal plants kill vastly more birds than do windmills. And if you cite the windmills back from the edge of the hill, they were sticking them right on the edge. If you cite them back a bit, that's not where the raptors float. You take a tiny loss in the capacity and you don't kill the birds. Now, bats are a tricky one, the vibration, and you might know something about yeah, this. It, unfortunately, it's, yes. unfortunately for the bats, is the, the, it, creates, it sucks the air out of their poor things, and, and there, is, there is a fix. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out the, how, what the vibration of the wind machine is matters, and we have settled on some uh, turbine designs and three-bladed as opposed to two-bladed that are much more prone to that kind of vibration that attracts the bats and then minces them up and, as you say, sucks, uh, sucks the oxygen out of the room. You've got to do it right. Merely saying you're green is not sufficient. Now, I'm much more worried about the vibration noise and how far that will travel mm -hmm. now than I had been before. You've got to do it right. We have time. Thank you, Hunter, for that. Um, we have time for one more question, and we have, we have other events, and I, I know that we should actually go on for at least 20 minutes here because I had a few things, and I'm keeping one more question. Don't want to talk to me. One more question, please, anybody? Yes, as I was uh, talking about earlier, uh, that uh, we do have a vertical wind power system, and it's uh, into the sail. It's a sail system, and it doesn't have a centerpiece. So we do have a netting on around it so that the uh, birds and animals don't get caught into it. And we could put it on top of this roof here and produce uh, energy for this whole building and probably a couple other buildings close by. In China, we have a Shanghai uh, uh, co uh, venture where they want to put the wind powers in the 5th, 10th, 15th, 20th floor. We also have a technology that is atmosphere water technology so you could produce uh, air, uh, you could produce water out of that. And if you put the wind power on top of your greenhouses and LED lights with your uh, hydroponics, you can grow your food year round. We have all the technologies that we need to solve every problem facing humanity. I think the real question is, do we have the wisdom? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to take one more or call it yeah, quits? Yeah. And, and is there anybody who is as inspired by Buckminster Fuller as Hunter and I have been? Uh, one more from the floor, please. And shout it out if you haven't got a microphone. Okay, uh, all right. Yvonne Chouinard's new book uh, is calling for moving from consumer to citizen. Highly recommend anything written by Yvonne, uh, particularly his first book, Let My People Go Surfing. Uh, it, take a look at Patagonia as a company. 
And in fact, I was just with Rick Ridgeway, their director of environment, who also sits on the Unilever advisory board. And Rick was saying, we keep growing. We don't want to grow, but we keep growing. What do we do? And I said, Rick, how about if you redefine what it means to grow? Grow the health of your workers. Grow the health of communities. Grow the well-being of people. Grow profit, but with less stuff. Because growth itself is not so much the problem as it is the throughput in the economy of stuff, digging up resources and then wasting it. And when Yvonne is calling for citizens, one of the things he's calling for is participation in a conversation. What does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to be a consumer? Here is the math facing Alberta, put forth by the humble college professor Bill McKibben. The world can withstand the emissions of 565 more gigatons of carbon and stay below 2 degrees C warming. The fossil fuel companies own and have in the ground proven reserves of 2,795 gigatons of carbon. If they burn it, life as we know it dies, unless we stop them. And there is now talk in the investment community, and I highly recommend you watch this video. Jeremy Grantham on Charlie Rose. The financial community, he runs a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. Financial community is now concerned about what they're calling the carbon bubble. All of this wealth, all this book value of companies that they cannot it cannot be real because if they burn it, life as we know it dies. So that's, you know, for Alberta, I think this is really the question. Bill McKibben's math and Jeremy Grantham's math, this is a math problem. And it's very interesting to me when the financiers and the limits to growth people come together. Uh, maybe I'm perverse, but that's what gives me hope that sustainability is an inevitability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Give her a bit of a hand. Come on. Thank you, Hunter.